to have you with us today, Doc. And um, I just want to remind everyone before we get started that uh, to, to keep your microphones muted until our question and answer portion, and uh, you'll be uh, able to ask your questions uh, personally to Dr. Magruder at that time. I also want to remind you that this is hosted by AMIA, the Advocates for Music and Music Education Association, where our mission is to cultivate, support, and enhance music and music education in the state of South Carolina through fostering academic partnerships, professional learning opportunities, and resources for classrooms. Today, we have Dr. McCurdy back with us to uh, continue his presentation uh, right where we left off last time. I, I hate that we weren't able to get it all in last time, but I'm excited to have him back again today and continue this for us. So, Mr. McLeod, hey, let me let me, let me be very brief as I introduce my, my brother, my classmate and uh, friend, Dr. Ronald McCurdy, who's the uh, professor of music in the Thornton School of Music at the University of Southern Cal. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he's a 1976 graduate of uh, Florida and M university and he's, uh, he got his master's and a PhD at the university of Kansas, where he was the recipient of the William P. Foster scholarship. And he's just, he's just done so many things in, in his, uh, young life. And I say young cause we're class based. And so certainly always proud of him. Uh, we reconnected now and we'll, we'll be in touch for forever. Now, but uh, Dr. McCurdy, I'm going to shut up and let you go ahead and do your, your thing, sir. you all have, a, have allowed me to come back and spend some time with you all. Um, full disclosure, like most professors, I've never met a microphone I didn't like. So that's why we went back for a second time because I was talking too long the last time. So I, I'm going to see if I can keep my my ideas within the hour that we have. And we're going to have an hour right? until uh, what, uh, one o'clock your time. Okay. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well. I know this this. Uh, a very challenging for everybody, both from a personal standpoint and worrying about our health and economics. And of course, we've all have certainly been moved by what we've seen on television with the George Floyd murders and, and the host of many others. I mean, we here at USC, uh, it's, it's nice. And I told my colleagues, my white colleagues, I said, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you all are, are as outraged as we are black. I must tell you, black folks, we've been outraged for about 400 years. I mean, we was we were just as outraged when Tamir Rice and Eric Gardner and Chandra Bland and and a host of others were were murdered by policemen with impunity. So, what I'm seeing right now, however, I'm seeing uh, a different movement right now. And, and those of us, Dr. McLeod and I, I mean, we're old enough to remember having seen the Edmund Pettus Bridge March. And we remember seeing on television the black and white images of Martin Luther King. And all, all those images, it was primarily African-Americans with a few white clergymen. But for the most part, it was a very homogeneous group of people, mostly African-Americans who were protesting. And I always use that this, this quote by Benjamin Franklin, which I think is apropos for the situation. And the quote is, justice will not be served until those unaffected are just as outraged as those who are. And what we're seeing right now, we're seeing a lot of white folks who've never been concerned because they've, they've been able to sort of uh, wallow in their white privilege to a point where uh, many of these issues don't matter. Uh, I was telling Brother Stackhouse and Brother McLeod before you all came on, I, I had a colleague at uh, USC who had the brilliant idea 
of how we could solve all of our racial problems. And the solution was to simply eradicate the word race from our vocabulary, and that would fix everything. With long story short, I was telling him he got fired yesterday. <laughs> He's gone. So what's happening right now, we have to be educated. We have to be more educated about our history. And I told my colleagues in, in the jazz department, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I was the chair in pop prop, uh, departments here. I said, you know, in many ways, we have been artistic carpet baggers. And what I mean by that is we've studied the music. We've learned the song from Motown. We've learned the John Coltrane and Miles Davis and Duke Ellington. But as a, as a university and as a, you know, in our curriculum, we've not taken the time to investigate where this music come from. What were the social, political, and economic variables that allowed this music to move forward? What was happening in 1920 when Duke Ellington played in the Cotton Club? What were the dynamics of the Cotton Club? Why did, why did, he, get, did he have to come in through the back door? Why was, why was it that all the women who danced in the Cotton Club had to be of a certain hue? Why, uh, why was Duke's band called Duke Ellington and his jungle band? Why, where did that come from? Why were all the patrons in the Cotton Club white and all the performers were black? Why did Robert Johnson not make any royalties off of this, off of this music? So all these things that were going on uh, during, this, during this period of time, we have to study. So what we're doing right now, we're making a requirement that all of our incoming freshmen and sophomores have to take my class called The Music of Black Americans, where we chronicle an understanding of all the musical contributions that were made by African Americans starting from 19 to present. So we get spirituals, gospel music, the blues, jazz, different iterations of jazz, hip hop, all that's a part of, of, of who we are as a people and those kinds of contributions. I ask, uh, now why am I talking about that right now as we're talking about improvisation? Because improvisation is at the core of who we are as musicians and as people. Think about it for just a moment. If you were an enslaved person and you came to this country in 1619 as an indentured servant, the language was different, food was different, the climate was different, and you were enslaved for the most part. If you could not improvise, you probably were not going to survive. Those who survived were those who were able to improvise. And what improvisation tells us is that that is a, that allows for our own self-expression self and our own creativity. And that's a big part of what we do. Now, so what I'm doing and what I've asked my colleagues to do is as we begin to teach music, let's take the time to include how we're gonna approach a certain piece of music to give the historical relevance and the historical background of where that music came from. So for example, if you're doing a Count Basie chart with your high school jazz band or whatever. Well, you should investigate where Count Basie came from. You know, he was from Red Springs. I mean, uh, he moved to Kansas City as part of the territorial bands. And he, he claimed uh, Kansas City as his home. But do, while, do, while he was in Kansas City, there was a mayor called Mayor Teddy Pendergast, oh, not Teddy Pendergast, Tom Pendergast. And Tom Pendergast, was a, he, he was the mayor, but he was also corrupt. And he ran the city like it was his own personal business. If you needed money, you go to, to Mayor Tom Pendergast. He also sold bootleg liquor. He did all those kind of things that were against the law, but that is what allowed, allowed the music to, 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 to flourish. So my point is in all of this, I think it's crucial as educators that we really take the time to do our homework and to explore the genesis of the music that we're teaching. And the same as, as you would with concert band or with choir. You want to go back and understand the history and, and the genealogy of where that music came from. Uh, one thing that, that I think is important about improvisation is, as well, if we look back at the whole African diaspora, or, or look back at African traditions of how music was created, in Africa, we know that music, poetry, and dance is something that every if you were, if you, if you belong to a certain village or tribe, everybody sang, everybody danced, and everyone was engaged in some type of music, uh, poetry. We had our griots, whose job it was to recount the deeds of kings and queens of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a respective tribe, and they did so via music and dance. 
They were the early rappers. The Griots were the first rappers because they, they, they did so with rhythm, with, with, with ex extemporaneously. They were our first freestylers, as, as young people would say. But it was about improvisation. Also in African culture, the performances and the music was about the performer and not the composer. In European culture, if you're doing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you're gonna go bum 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 right. You're not gonna you can you're not gonna come in and say you know what dog I'm not really feeling this today. I think I'm gonna do something a little different. Bum 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 bum. That's gonna be your last day in the symphony. You're done. So your job is to recreate what has already been written. But I'll tell you, no self-respecting jazz card-carrying musician would ever play a song the same way every night. Give you an example. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald did a series of songbooks uh, celebrating the music of different America, of, of, of American composers. She did one with, with Jerome Kern, with Cole Porter, with Duke Ellington, and George Gershwin. And it was a song that, that, that George Gershwin had written called Can't Take That Away From Me. It was kind of a Tin Pan Alley song. The way you wear your hat. Mm. The way you sip your tea. The memories of all that. Now, that is not how a jazz singer would ever perform that song. She went, the way you wear your hat. The way you sip your tea. The memories of all that. Oh no, you can't take that away from me. No, you can't take that away from me. Right, same song, but what, what does she do? She personalized it. And that's the huge difference between European art music and dare I say, African derived music. Because that includes not only just jazz, but it includes spirituals, gospel music, R&B. You, you, it's you putting your own personal stamp on the music, you know. Sometimes I go to a Laker game when they were, when they were still playing in the in the in the uh, Staples Center, and they would often have an R and B singer would come out and sing the national anthem. I go, oh crap, here we go. <laughs> it's gonna be a while. Bring a lunch <laughs> instead of oh say can you see by no 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 oh say can you see by the dawn's early it goes on forever. Why? Because they're personalizing this. They're making it their own. That's improvisation. So that's kind of the, 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 the history of, of where that came from, the whole notion of personification, of the, the personification of music, of the performance. Now, getting to where you all are as educators, and this is the part that, that makes I was, was talking with, with uh, Brother Oscar before you all came on. He told me that he's a band director, does band, jazz band, concert band, marching band, teach, coach the track team. He peel up when too, I don't know, closing the windows and shutting the doors, attacking the cheap, probably doing everything. So the question becomes when is he going to have time to teach improvisation to his kids in the class? Probably never, except if you think in a smart, holistic way. When I, my first teaching job was at the University of Kansas, right, where I did my doctorate, as Dr. McLeod said. And when I, when I finished my doctorate, I became, I, 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 was, I, to, I, I was head of a jazz program. And we didn't have, well, we, we had a jazz band. We didn't have a jazz program. We had a jazz, we had two or three jazz bands. And during my time there, we had jazz bands, combos, vocal jazz, improv classes. But initially, most of my top players in, in my top jazz band were not music majors. I only had them two days a week for two hours, which is when the jazz ensembles rehearsed. Mondays and Wednesdays from one to three. And that was our rehearsal time. So I had to figure out, I've got to make sure that we get everything within this two hours or four hours a week. So with, within, the, with, with, within the context of our rehearsal, I include addition, arranging, improvisation, and history. So I made it a point that I would include certain things that you, that you could do that would allow uh, improv improvisation to be taught within the context of a class. So first thing we did, <clears throat> we would take uh, 
these bebop heads. Because bebop, is, this is what we study primarily. I mean, everything that we teach primarily in, in school right now tends to revolve around this genre called bebop, circa 1941, the beginning of World War II, to, I want to say maybe 1955 or so. And, and to, even to this day, uh, even some of the contemporary players, you can still hear the remnants of bebop in their playing. And this is approach. This approach was more of a, of a linear. What, what, I, what I attempted to do when, when I first came on this this afternoon was to play lines. Improvisation. So, as opposed to what Louis Armstrong was doing, was more of, of a vertical style. Right, playing arpeggios. Dizzy, Clifford Brown were playing. Playing lines. So that's a whole, a whole different style of, of, of improv. I think I just saw Mr. Pryor from Coleman. Hey, Mr. Pryor from, how you doing, sir? I'm doing fine, sir. How you doing? Great. Everybody, you should know this. No Mr. Pryor from, no Ron McCurdy. That's it. This was my high school band director, my mentor, my second daddy, all wound up into one. So I'm, I'm I'm honored that you are here this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. All right. So anyway, I'll continue. So anyway, so the whole concept of of, of improvisation, it's a language. And think of this analogy. Think of when you first learn to speak, you, you're not talking in complete sentences. You learn one or two words, you learn mine, mine, no, daddy, mama, whatever it is you, the first word you say. You're not speaking in complete sentences. You learn one or two words, you put those words together and then gradually, by the time you're two or three years old, you can, you can speak in, 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 in short sentences. Hopefully by the time you're five or six years old, you can, you can speak in, in compound sentences. You can speak in paragraphs. And hopefully by the time you get in high school, you can speak with authority and with clarity. The same thing happens as you learn how to improvise. And speaking of Mr. Patrick, I remember as a kid in Belgrade, I would go over to his house and he would put on records. We would listen. I mean, I learned about Clifford Brown through Mr. Patrick. I learned about, you know, about uh, uh, Blue Mitchell and all the great you know, you know, Snooky Young, all the great trumpet players, I learned through him because we would listen. We wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily try to answer, we would just listen. And just as you learn to speak a language, thing, the same thing happens when you learn the language of jazz. Think about this for just a second. Regardless of your, of, of your ethnicity, if you grew up in a home where people spoke French, guess what? You'd be speaking French because that's what you would hear. If you grew up in a home where they're speaking Russian or Swahili, or what other language you, you would hear, be, be exposed to. That's, that's exactly what you would be speaking. So the whole idea of, of, of how we learn to play this music is by listening to it. I remember my father, who was a high school principal, who, he would wake up every morning around five o'clock or so. He would read two newspapers, music. I mentioned this the last time when we had our session. And my, 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 my brother and me, we, I mean, by the time we were 18 years old, we had heard, I mean, we had a pretty, eclectic collection of music on our hard drive because my father would listen to everything from the Sons of the Pioneers to Box B Minor Mass, uh, Ray Charles, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington. I mean, we heard all that music as kids growing up. And we'd play in the yard, we'd be playing in the yard and we'd be singing. That's Ella Fitzgerald's solo on Artists Get a Tasket, right? So to this day, that's still on my hard drive. I never forgot it. I also remember in high school, we've had these little pep rallies and I think Mr. Patrick, well, somebody did an arrangement of Raising in the Grass. Remember that song, Who Master Keela? And that was the first solo that I actually transcribed. But that was the solo. Still on my hard drive. You never forget it. It's like riding a bicycle. So what, what does that tell us? It tells us just how important 
listening ears. Now, the theoretical principles aren't nearly as important. Again, using my, my language analogy, how many of us at age five, six, seven, eight years old knew what a dangling participle was? We didn't know. I mean, we maybe knew nouns and verbs and adverbs, but we didn't know all the parts of speech to a point that, that it was really ingrained in our, in, our, in our understanding, but we could still talk. The same thing is true with jazz. Maybe we don't know what, what tritone substitution is. We're going... We don't know what that is, but we hear it, and we, and we can identify by hearing it. And that's the kind of thing that I think is so important. I remember Roy Hargrove, God rest his soul, he died a year or so ago, when Roy Hargrove, Hargrove was in high school, do we all know who Roy Hargrove is or was? He passed away. He was a wonderful trumpet player out of uh, out of Dallas, Texas. But Roy, Roy came from a very impoverished situation, and, and he had a kind of a raggedy horn. Band director, his high school band director, so important, uh, gave him a horn. But more importantly, he would give Roy a song to take home each night to transcribe. And Roy, and he, and, he never, and he never told him how hard it was. He said, take this Clifford Brown solo on Joy Spring, transcribe this and bring it back tomorrow and be able to play it. And Roy Hargrove would do it. He would just do it. He knew all those solos. He could just play it from memory. And he could do it in all 12 keys. <laughs> so... That told us right away that, again, the, the, the importance of listening is absolutely crucial. After you learn that vocabulary, then you can go out back and figure out, this is a noun, this is an adverb, this is a dingling participle. Now you understand what, what, what the language, or what the theoretical principles are. This is a two chord. This is a five chord. This is a one chord. But is that important when you're just starting out? Absolutely not. Not important at all. So transcribing, another another process that I think is important, the least important aspect of, of the transcribing process is to writing it down. Keeping in mind that three-fifths of all the music in the world is not written down. Notation is very much a European concept. African music is not written down. Indian music is not written down. There's no notation for that per se. You learn, you learn it orally. And in many ways, jazz is and was a kind of oral concept as well. You learn to play it by listening to it, you know, which is why most of us who, you know, who direct jazz bands, when you see uh, a, a, a line written on the, on, on, the, uh, on the music, you see the location, and you see a song like uh, Sad and Doll, and you see eighth note, you will go ta, 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 ta. Ta 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 ta. That tells me right away that you haven't listened to Duke Ellington play Zad and Dahl before. Because if you did, you would be going dee do dit, dee do dit, dee do dit. Because it's, it's impossible to notate exactly how the music is played. It's giving you the sort of the, the, an approximation of the, of the rhythms, but the actual nuances and inflections that you have to use when you play jazz, you can't write that down. It's, it's, it's like trying to notate a bird chirping. You can't notate what, what birds sound like when they're chirping. You can't write that down. In some ways, jazz is kind of the same way. Now, let me give you some things to do in, in your classes that'll help you out, that'll help your students out. I recommend kids walking into your, into your rehearsals. As they're walking in, pulling their instruments out, getting, warming up, whatever. The first thing you do, you pick five minutes of your rehearsal playing a recording for the band to listen to. It could be Duke Ellington, it could be Count Basie, it could be Clifford Brown, it could be Miles Davis, it could be John Coltrane, it could be Nicholas Payton, it could be whomever you want, his brain music. You listen, you analyze, you imitate, and then last one, this last one, you, you assimilate. The analyzation part, this is when you figure out, is it a major key or a minor key? Did the line ascend or did it descend? What what tessitura did they use while they were performing? What what uh, techniques did they use while they were performing? All those things become important as the listening process. Another thing that I would have my I would have my students do at Kansas 
Every semester for the midterm and for the final exam, we would have show and tell, where everyone in the band had to pick one solo of their choice that they had to transcribe, play with the recording in class in front of everybody. Now it was it was pretty, <laughs> it was very nerve wracking for a lot of students to do that. And the first time I did it, it was terrible. I mean, couldn't do it. But what happened, there will always be one little whiz kid or two whiz kids in your classes who will, who will, who will really embrace the assignment. They'll come back and they'll nail it. The rest of the class go, well, how in the hell did Johnny do that? You know better than I am. So the next time you do it, you'll see two, two or three more other kids will, will pick up on it. Within two years of me doing this, everybody in my band could improvise. And I'll tell you, when, when, when the entire band has a handle on improvisation, the band swings better because they understand how to interpret the notation. They won't go ta 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 ta. They won't do that because they because they don't have a concept. They, 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 they will have internalized how you interpret the notation. So they'll go dee do dee b do dee dee do dee. B do it right. That's what they'll do. How's my time? Ooh, I'm halfway done, y'all. This is this is the half. This is the quickest hour of my whole day, y'all. <laughs> so let me let me move on. Um, so you will find that gradually, within a year or so, everybody in the band will be improvising, and your job will be to help them find a solo that's with, that's within their grasp. When, when I transcribe that that Who Master Kilo Grazing in the Grass solo. I, could, I mean, I must have been in about ninth or tenth grade when I did that. That was easy for me. I could I, technically I could play it. I could hear it. It wasn't it wasn't a lot of notes. It, it, it wasn't John Coltrane's Giant Steps for my first transcription. It was Who Master Kila. And then I remember transcribing um, my father. I'm, I'm not sure why, but he looked, used to love Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. And Mr. Perry, you'll appreciate this one. That's how I learned how to do, double tone. He would go da 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 da. That's how I learned how to double tongue from listening to Herb Albert and Tijuana One of Brass, <laughs> you know. And then I applied it to you know, so, so you you're able to learn, but but I had a concept for what double tonguing sounded like from having heard Herb Albert. Then, of course, I graduated. I had, a, I had a student years ago who was a big fan of, of, of Kenny G. Now, this is, this, is a, this is a great pedagogical thing for you teachers. Wherever your student will start, let them start there. Now, I personally am, am not and, and have never been a big fan of Kenny G. I mean, in many ways, he is not really a jazz player by traditional standards. But this kid... He loved Kenny G. He had his hair grow long. He had a fan for the, his hair blowing in the wind. He's playing off to the side. He, I mean, he mm. just thought Kenny G was the best thing since the hula hoop. He loved Kenny G. What did I do? I didn't try to say, man, you should be listening to John Coltrane. You don't be with Kenny G. He can't really play that well. I didn't do that. I said, man, that's great. What's want to transcribe one of Kenny G's solos. And he did. Came in and he played, and he played it beautifully. But what happened over a period of time, he grew. He realized that what Kenny G was doing was okay for what he was trying to do, but then he, then he discovered, he, he finally did discover John Coltrane, Cannonball Adelaide, Sonny Stitt, and his listening began to improve in terms of who he was listening to. And he began to realize this is the real deal versus something else. So again, my message in all of this is how important it is that we really instill this, this notion of listening on a, on a, on a consistent basis. So you're saying, well, well, Ron, I only have an hour for rehearsal, you know, two days a week. Why, why would I spend five minutes listening to music when I could be rehearsing the, the music? The answer is, if you, if you invest the time in listening, that, those concepts will be ingrained and, and, and it will expedite your rehearsal process. My thinking is rehearsals really should be a time for putting the music together as opposed to learning notes and figuring out rhythms. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that has been my mindset for years. Okay, a couple things you can do. My other mentor was David Baker, a uh, professor at Indiana University. He was someone that I just, I just absolutely loved. He, he passed away maybe three years ago, three or four years ago. And 
David, he was a downbeat number one tr trombone player, was with George Russell with that chromatic approach to uh, improvisation, played in Stan Kenton's band. He, and he was just a brilliant scholar and musician, composer, and a very eclectic musician because he wrote symphony orchestras, he wrote concertos for symphonies, he wrote band music, he wrote big band charts, he wrote string quartets. I mean, he was just a very versatile musician. But and he was, a, he was kind of on, in the vanguard of the whole pedagogical movement in terms of jazz education. And he wrote many books on jazz improvisation. And one thing that he would always uh, encourage band directors to do would use the, the bebop tunes as etudes. And what I mean by that, if you're taking a tune like, let's say, uh, Groovin' High, the song goes. <laughs> That's, that's vocabulary. So what David would have students do, and that, that particular pattern happens over the minor to dominant chord progression. And without getting too heavy on the third part, we know in a major key, two is minor, five is dominant, one is major. So two, five, one in the key of C would be D minor, G7, C major 7. Two five one. In the key of, of E flat, two would be F, five would be B flat seven, one would be E flat. Right? So one of the most common progressions in jazz would be that two five one progression. Minor, dominant, tenor. Ba ba ya ba 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 there is two la 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 ba 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 Minor, five, right? So that, 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 that progression is everywhere. So it would behoove you to figure out vocabulary to play over minor, dominant, to tonic. So what David suggested we do, if we take in these bebop heads, First of all, we learn the style. And I would recommend, as David did, that you have your entire band play these heads in unison, including your guitar players, including your drummers. So if, so if you're doing uh if you're doing uh grooving high, now, the rule here, as, as you will hear from how Jasper phrased it, they accent the first note, the highest note, and the last note of a phrase. It's lit. And this is what jazz players do. This is how we, this is how we interpret the, 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 the phrase. This is how we phrase. We wouldn't go. We wouldn't do that. The lowest note, we ghost. Right? So if you understand that when you when you're improvising, you're gonna do the same thing when you're playing a chart. Right? And, and this is what makes your band swing, and this is what allows your solo to play with some degree of authenticity. Couple, here's a quick story. A couple of years ago, I, I used to adjudicate a lot of jazz festivals all over the country. And there's one festival they would have it uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, called the Jazz Championships. I won't call the guy's name because some of you may know him. But he would pick his four charts in August that he was going to play for the jazz festival in April. Now you do the math. August, April, playing four charts every day for what six, seven, eight months. Every nothing was left to chance. The rhythm comping patterns were all worked out, bass lines were all worked out, and and in his mind, most importantly, all the improvised air quotes, improvised solos were also worked out. Now, jazz music, as I mentioned earlier, is about the not knowing. 
when you improvise, you don't you don't plan your solos. You react. You're having this musical conversation, which is why the rhythm section and the improviser are so important. And you, if if you have a big band, you play all the all the tootie section, right? Do all that, and come time for the solo section. Your big band becomes that because it's piano, bass, drums, and the horn. It's a quartet, so it's a small group. So you, have to, so you have to have that kind of a small group mentality as you rehearse that part of your band. And if you're doing that, the improviser, he or she, they're communicating with the rhythm section. How you feel today, Red? Man, I'm doing fine, Mark. What's going on, man? How, how you doing with this COVID-19, man? Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cooped up in the house, but I'm all right. You're having a conversation. And, and there's a sense of, 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 of deference. In other words, you're deferring to the bass player. You're deferring to the drummer and, and, and vice versa. This is how you have that kind of musical conversation. Now, back to the whole idea of these bebop heads, most, most guitar players are not accustomed to reading lines. They can play chords, whatever, but they can't read. Most of them can't do that. Bass players are not accustomed to playing lines. Jordan, you look awfully comfortable, man. Jordan, you all right, bro? Jordan, y'all see Jordan down there? Is he asleep? Jordan, you there? All right, <laughs> man, you look so comfortable, man. I appreciate that. Anyway, but anyway, so and drummers, I'm not used to playing, playing lines. So, so I have my drummers go da da, da da, da 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 you wouldn't do that. Beta, beta, right? So I would take a couple of heads a week and I would have the band learn them in the original key. You would take it up a half step. So now we got, we go, so, so we learn the song in different keys. And that way, keys won't matter to you after a while. Uh, you got the bass player playing it. Then I would have them I would have them play every other measure of the head. So now we're gonna go now why we do that? Because that silence allows them to feel the time. You gotta feel the time. Right? You, you plan, you, you're playing the song, but you're resting every other measure to feel the time. What normally happens when people rush, they're not feeling time. The silence is what will, will allow you to feel the time. So after you've done that, then you would maybe extract one, one lick from the song. In this case, we'll take this little bit. It happens. Let me see if I can pull this up right quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen with you guys. Hang on, stick. Bear with me for just a second. I want to pull this up. I had it here just a second ago. Hang on, hang on, just a second. Let me share my screen. We, we, we came. We logged in early so we can have all this stuff all worked out before I before y'all got here. But clearly, I didn't. Yeah. I did it right. Wait a minute. Not even... Just click the screen and then it should pop up to the bottom. Now. Okay, 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 okay. There we go, present my entire screen. Don't forget to click the actual video box. Yeah, I know how it is here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Zoom guy, man. I haven't, I, I haven't learned all the other stuff yet. <laughs> there we go, allow. You got me now? There you go. Yep. Okay. 
this is not something I want to show you guys, but, I, but for right now, I'll share it to you anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll still use, don't, don't look at this for right now. Uh, I'll, I'll use for an example, and I'll send you guys a copy of, of this lead sheet on, on Groove and High, where the song goes, ba da ba da bo bo ba da ba de bo ba ba do ba That's a lick. bo bo ba da ba de bo ba bo da ba And it starts on the, on the, on the, on the, Sharp on, on the on, on the on the ninth of the dominant chord. I, I, I don't I don't want to get too technical here. So, so, so the chord is A minor seven to D seven. So two five in the key of G. A minor to D seven. Let it go. So what they will have you do, you would take that same lick, that one vocabulary idea, and you would take it down by half step. So maybe you would go. Now, I would also have a student sing it, have them sing it with the rhythm section playing the corporate Chris. Because the thing is, another thing, as you're improvising, if you don't hear the line in your head first, you're not going to be able to play it. You, 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 like you don't just put the horn to your face and start pressing buttons down or whatever, and, and then magic happens. The idea happens in your head first, and then from there, you your your horn becomes an extension of your voice. That's why that's why you, you hear me singing so much right now rather than playing it on my horn. Like, even, like well, I can sing, I can also play, but but it's, it starts with the idea of being in my head. <laughs> Right. So right away, I'm, I'm able to to take those those chord progressions and extract vocabulary from that. I could go another line goes. And this is another thing. Last time we met, I'm not sure if, 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 if all of you were with me last time, but I gave uh, uh, Brother Stackhouse some pi some piano voicing, the same that I'm playing for you right now. I think as a band director, when you have a break in your in your busy day, if you've got five minutes, you go to the piano. It's a good idea to practice your two five one progressions. So you become comfortable doing that because that will help your ears. And, and really, being a jazz musician is really playing by ear. You can still read music and reading is absolutely crucial, but you're basically playing by ear. You're playing what you hear in your head. And you're, and you're quick enough to react to it. You're quick enough to, to take what you're hearing in your head and transfer it immediate, immediately to your, to your instrument. I'm gonna stop in the next couple of minutes because I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave some time for some uh, questions. Do take a look at this. This, this is a uh, sad dog. Right, sad dog. Now, look, looking at this lead sheet, this was a book I did a couple of years ago called Approaching the Standards. And what I did, I took uh, maybe eight or nine tunes, and I did this as a as a as a, as a vocal book primarily. And uh, in fact, Reed, you'll laugh at this because you might remember, I think you and I took voc vocal techniques from Prof King our senior year. And, I, and you probably don't remember this part, but I went, I was sort of asked to be the class spokesperson. I said, Professor King, with all due respect, as you look around, you can see that we have all instrumentalists in this classroom. And 
we don't we, we will never need to know this vocal information that just you're going to talk to us about diphthongs and vowels and consonants we don't really need to know that because we're all instrumentalists and professor king turned around and said mr mccurdy never say never he could have called me a jerk or worse but he did he just said never say never right three years later i'm standing in front of a vocal jazz ensemble and the group sucked but it wasn't them it was me I didn't pay attention in this class. <laughs> you know, I said, this, this doesn't sound right. They don't something wrong here. They don't really sound, they don't swing or I mean the, the words don't sound clear. And I went back and had to take some 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 remedial vocal classes, learn about vowel unification and diphthongs and consonants and vocal production. And I called Professor King three or four years ago and said, Professor Prop King, you remember me, but I was like, oh yes, Mr. McCurdy, I remember you. I just want to call it apologize. <laughs> you know? So anyway, the vocal thing is is so real. I mean, because if, again, and most of us grew up in church, so we so we are we are accustomed to singing. But your students who who haven't grown up in the church won't necessarily be accustomed to singing. So you got to get them to sing. So anyway, in this book, the second page, I wrote out solos over the changes. In this case, to Sad and Dog, as you can see here. Now another funny story. When I, when I wrote the book. We came time to record the the, 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 the the track for the book. We had this, uh, the producer had hired these vocalists to sing the, the, the sing the, my written out solos. And the female singer was amazing, but the guy singer came in, he, me, 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 ah, 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 all the opera stuff. So on this solo, he went, ba do ba ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba ba do ba ba do ba do ba da ba ba da and we were like, holy crap, what are we going to do? This is not going to work. So the producer paid the guy, sent him home, said, Ron, you're going to have to sing this. I go, man, I didn't come prepared to sing it. I wrote it. I didn't come prepared to sing it. He said, no, you're going to have to sing this. So all right, I'll give it a shot. So long story short, my voice is on the one. I mean, I ended up singing all these solos. This particular track, and this is a great way to get your student to learn vocabulary. What I have here, again, is that 2 5 progression minor, D minor 7 to G7, E minor 7 to A7. It's a 2 5 progression, as if it doesn't go to 1. I'm, I'm taking 5, 6, 1, and I'm talking about scale degrees. 5, the D natural is 5 of G. That one little lick is so powerful because it's, it's a pickup into where you're going. It anticipates what's about to happen harmonically. So we have now ba do ba 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 ba do da ba do ba ba do ba. See what I'm doing there? And wherever you are, if you can, I'm, I'm gonna play it. See if you can sing along with me. We do it real slow. One, two, one, two, or one, two, three. Ba do ba. Again, and this is just basic vocabulary. So in closing, before our time runs out, I would say, if, if, if you remember nothing that I've said today, you've got to have your students become accustomed to listening to recordings. And, I'll, and I can send you a list of people that you should may, may perhaps have them listen to. Start with, start with something that they can relate to. I mean, there, there was a song that uh, Herbie Hancock did years ago called uh, Cantaloupe Island. Right, so they can relate, and I think that song was covered by a rapper a few years ago. So 
find things that, they, that, that, that the students can relate to and then allow them, you know, find one kid who's going to be your overachiever, who's going to go, who will learn everything in all 12 keys, who will, you know, learn different styles and learn piano and learn bass. Find that kid and have that kid be your role model for the other kids. Okay, I'm going to stop now. I've covered a lot of stuff. And again, I'll tell you, uh, this is this is not rocket science, but, but it needs to be consistent. Are there any questions from anybody? Yes, sir. Far yes, sir. Away. We have a uh, first from uh, Charlton. I'm stop sharing. Okay. And go ahead. What's the question? Um, good afternoon, uh, Brother McCurdy. Uh, thank you for being here. Yes, sir. Um, uh, we can talk a lot about how to help the students, but a lot of times uh, in what I have seen as a, as a former music um, a, uh, educator and a jazz musician, that a lot of times, especially in our state, and this is just my opinion, but we have a lot of teachers that are just afraid to yes. teach yeah. jazz because they don't know how, they don't know it about it themselves, and they probably came from a college that had nobody to teach them. They probably played in an ensemble where they played like grade three music or grade four music, maybe even that had solos written out, but did not have an instructor that knew how to teach these future educators how to teach jazz. Right. So yeah, yeah. how do you, how would you recommend for any band directors that are out there now that don't have a program to start when they don't necessarily have the comfort level of talking about it themselves? I think, first of all, you have to leave your ego outside the door because it's not about you. You have to make sure that you are in what I call student mode all the time. Here I am at 66 years old. I am still very much a student. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm studying, trying to get better every day. So I think if if if, if you tell the student, look here, we're in this together. My, my, when, I, when I got to Kansas, if, Red, you remember? I mean, we had a jazz band at FAMU, but but but, but, but we didn't rehearse during marching season. And we would have maybe one or two concerts a year. That was pretty, it, it, there was no improv classes. I mean, there was no jazz program per se like it is right now. And I mean, I, and I probably knew this much more than my students did at Kansas, that much more. So I said, look guys, we, we're gonna do this together. We're gonna learn together. And, and, and I gave an assignment, I would do it myself. So I think you have to relinquish your ego and go into student mode and Study. I mean, I, I would go to. I mean, I would go to conferences. I would make sure. I, would, I mean, I would go to all the state conferences. The back in the when IAJ was around. I would go to that conference. I would, you know, I would, I would just immerse myself in trying to get better. So I think if you do that, then if you fail, my, my, my adage is, even if you fall on your face, you're still moving forward. That's how I look at it. <laughs> you know, so I wouldn't worry about you know being embarrassed because we're all trying to learn. We're all trying to get better. In the words of Nike. Just do it. Just do it. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, Charlton. Yes. If, if you had, um, I guess, the opportunity to do it all over again on mm -hmm. that first job assignment um, at Kansas, um, what would you do differently? Well, well, I, I kind of broke up a little bit. What, what would I do differently? Uh, I would probably spend more time on composition, yes. learning, learning more about counterpoint. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. I mean, I, I, I can surely I can I can write, but I would I think I would be a, even a better writer if I really went back and studied the scores of Beethoven and Brahms and Berlioz and Chopin, Stravinsky. You know, if, 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 because all of jazz music in many ways is a continuation of art music, in my opinion. That we find in jazz, we find the same harmonies in, in Stravinsky, and then because they, they were influenced by jazz music. So I would probably want to spend more time learning about composition and learning more about culture and history. It's funny because my time at Kansas, most, most my my 14 years there, I've only taught courses dealing with music. I was one of those artistic carpet baggers, just studying the music without understanding the culture. It wasn't until I got to Minnesota when I had to teach that class in music of black Americans that, that I began to really peel back the layers of history to really understand where the music came from 
who were the primary progenitors and what were the conditions that allowed the music to happen. So I would, I would probably be more taking anthropology classes and reading, reading James Baldwin and W.E.B. Du Bois and really immersing myself in that history so that I, I could speak with a, with, with, with a much more authoritative voice. Hey, um, back up. Kiss, you know, just, just today. Just, yeah, go ahead. Ernest, can I ask a question? Ernest. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, I wanna I wanna just follow up with uh, what Charles said. Uh what Charles said was so so actually important, but but what McCurdy had that that what a director is able to do, he's able to show them the value of practicing and the value of having some kind of system that you that you can do that will improve your playing. He had that in Mr. Pfeiffer. So I don't know what kind of jazz program. I know they got a great program at uh, at the school, but but the band director cannot lessen their role because they can teach the kids the value of practicing and just to stick to it. So if they do that, then it's easy to transition. Plus, he was a student. When you go to college, you have to have a great great experience in college, at least from the theoretical standpoint. And mm -hmm. and we, we had that we had that great opportunity because we had some very good uh, uh, theory teachers and form an analysis. So we learned a lot like that. And so he transferred that into what he's doing now. So, mm -hmm. so the band director can't lessen their role. Even if they don't know the jazz, they, they, they still have to teach the kid how to do stuff and how to practice and how to make themselves better. But thank you, Sean. Now, that's a great point that you made. I, I would also say uh, band directors, I know sometimes like I, I was speaking uh, earlier with uh, what was I talking about? I have to get the words now. But we we're talking about how busy he was. But I would say my best, my biggest advice to all of you is to never put your instrument down. Playing, keep. I mean, keep your keep your chops up. I, I, I know your days are full and you got a lot of things going on. But what I always appreciate about Mr. Pyron, his home was never in the case. He was always on a stand in his office. It was never in the case. So if, if he had five or ten minutes between classes, he would play some. You know, he'd play a little bit. He'd play, he'd, so he would be playing all throughout the day. And, 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 and that didn't go unnoticed by me. Right? Like, in my home, at home right now, my horn's never in the case. I, I, mean, I, have like, I have like two or three horns in my house. I have a horn in my bedroom, a horn in the, in the TV room, a horn in my office. So wherever I am, I pick up the horn and start playing. Play throughout the day. So my advice to you all is to keep your chops because you never know how much you can inspire a young kid by hearing you play. That was my that was my inspiration. I heard people play. I heard Mr. Parkin play. I heard my father play. Well, he wasn't that good, but he played a little trumpet just enough to get me inspired. I heard uh, uh, who who's the guy, Mr. Parkin, from who played all those instruments in, in Palm Beach County. Uh, played trombone, trumpet, saxophone. What was his name? Remember his name, Mr. Parkin? Mr. Parkin, still there? You know? I'm I'm trying to get back up. Do you hear me now? Oh. Do you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. It, it was it was Bill Prince. Yeah, yeah, Bill Prince. Yeah, Bill Prince. This guy, I mean, I was in ninth grade. I remember in seventh, seventh, eighth grade. I was in the, I was in the all county Palm Beach County Honors Band. And back in those days, all the bands were played. To, I mean, they would be on, on the same concert. And we would set up. The senior high band would be there. The middle school band that I was in was there, and then the jazz band. And Bill Prince was was the guest conductor for the all county jazz band. That was my yeah. first time hearing a, I mean, a guy of that caliber playing. Flute, trumpet, saxophone. I mean, you play all the instruments, all at the same level. And that's an indelible impression on me. I never forgot. I, was, I think I was in eighth grade when that happened. So my, again, my, 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 for you all is to keep your, keep your chops up, practice, you know? All the time. All the time. <clears throat> any other questions, anybody? All right. Do we have any other questions? Anybody out there, any other questions? You can chime in at this time. Jennifer, you there? Jennifer? I am here. You there? Any questions you have, my dear? Not to put, not to put you on the spot, like um, I kind of did, did you? Well, yes, uh, I am. Yeah, you, you put me on the spot, <laughs> Doc. <laughs> um, well, I'm a middle school band director, so I guess I was just listening to you how to introduce it to the younger players. Um, would it be better to 
I was looking at Charlton also about the jazz study books. Like um, I have those Rubank books, but I'm just thinking about introducing it to middle school students. Um, you know, on the younger level, mm -hmm. is it good? And just teaching improv improvisation. Like, what are some better ways to teach that, and how to introduce it to like middle school age students? Because that's no different. My beginner band started sixth grade. The, the, the most the most important thing is is that, is that they learn how to play the instrument first. You can't play jazz, classical, right. or you can't play anything if you can't play the instrument. And again, that's what that's, that's right. the condition that I got in high school is, is being able to play the trumpet first of all. So I would so whatever you're teaching, you're trying to you're trying to instill great fundamentals: breathing, articulation, sound, tone. All those things are inherent in any style of music. So I would start with and insist on the same degree of of, of, of specificity in jazz band as you would in your concert band. There's no difference. You're just wearing a different hat, you know? So, and, and I think also we, we have to be creative as teachers to a point where we've, we take the kids wherever they are. If you've got a bunch of kids who come out of the church, you know, or, or who, who, who listen to a lot of rap music, start with that. Don't, you don't, don't, that. Don't, you know, don't, uh -huh. don't, don't, don't try and push. Sorry, go ahead, Mr. Byron. You have to teach out of your fear. Don't be mm -hmm. afraid. Uh, we played two jazz selections last year on my, on my my elementary band. We got third, fourth, and fifth graders. We played two jazz tunes, so we, don't be afraid. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes, they don't, don't be afraid. afraid. They just know they enjoyed it. We had a good time. Yeah, and I'll say no one has ever died from trying this. No one's gonna die. <laughs> no one will die. I mean, you got to just, uh, just jump out there. Just, I, I did a, I but did a you, band. But I did you a feel, band. I'm sorry, but you will feel good, though. you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did an honor band in, uh, in, in Texas a couple of years ago. And this was an inner city school. The kids were, you know, they, they were kind of okay, but they, none of them had any jazz experience. But they had it in them, but they didn't know it. And I said, how many of y'all like listening to rap music? And all the hands went up. I said, what's your favorite song? I said, it's your birthday, it's a party, it's your birthday. I said, stop right there. I said, that rhythm that you just sang, keep that same rhythm, but use these three notes. Right away, they started to sound like almost like jazz players, just like that, because they understood the rhythm, but they didn't understand the theory of the, of the vocabulary. So my point is, Take it wherever, wherever they are. That's where you start, and you and you hopefully can 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 just like my, my, that one student I had who was a lover of Kenny G. You know, eventually he he grew out of Kenny G. I grew out of Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. <laughs> you know, you grew out of it. You, you, your, your 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 listening becomes much more astute. Oscar, you got a question? Anybody? Actually, don't have a question. You touched on all the things I wanted to learn about. I know I want to practice my horn more now. <laughs> James, you good? You got a question? Um, James, um, unmute yourself, James. Unmute. James, you got a question? Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, no, I don't have a question. No, I don't have a question. I just want to say hello. I met. We met together at IJ in the eighties. Ooh. Um, up until the 90s, I think, uh, up in 2000, Russell Thomas and I. Yes, uh, yeah, I, just, I, I just tried to call Russell yesterday. That's back when both of our beers were, were part of that like little day, wasn't it? Right, yeah. <laughs> we, both, we, we both played in the uh, 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 Jimmy Cole's big band. Yes, yes, yes. We played, we played but hey, just want to say hello. Great job, guys. But don't be afraid. To, don't be afraid to step out on this jazz thing in high school and junior high school. I mean, it's great. Just play some pop songs. Play some pop songs. Yeah. Convert it to jazz. Play some pop songs. Hey, thank you very much, guys. Okay, uh, okay, guys. So Stackhouse is back. Can I say something real quick? Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Um, One of the things that I used to do with my middle school students is I would take easy songs that were in their method books and try to get them to do simple improvisations yeah for example, <laughs> for example you could take Can hot you hear cross me? buns 
All right, you got that. That's how it's written. Now let's try and variate that a little bit. Yeah, da, da. Even if it's just one little anticipation, that's uh-huh. gonna start them thinking and then try to get them to just get a little bit further, a little bit further. You can do that with Hoss Cross Buns. You can do that with um, Mary Had a Little Lamb. You can do that mm-hmm. with Happy Birthday. Yeah. Um, any of those songs uh-huh. that they know already. Or you could even get them with listening to songs. I mean, I always tell my students, you know that rap song backwards and forwards. You know every inflection <laughs> that your yeah. favorite from your favorite Usher song. You know everything. Try and listen to that and put it through your horn very slowly, but that's a way to get them listening. And then you can gradually take them to something else that's, that's, that's a little bit more uh, jazzy or from, from a jazz musician. If you've got that's a hot top saxophone player, once they get through with that advanced Rubank, you know, book, put mm-hmm. them on the Omni book from Charlie Parker and see how they go with that. Mm-hmm. You, know? but you, you gotta, you gotta, you, you gotta, think out of the box that way especially with those songs that they already know exactly and that's something that will get them interested yes indeed man i'm enjoying this i, I, think, I guess our time has run out before we say goodbye uh I'm, as i mentioned earlier i'm doing a, a new project with my links and news project where i'm combining education academics with the arts so if, 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 if any of you guys have uh colleagues in english social studies and history uh and they want to have kind of an interactive, different experiential learning, send me an email and let me know. And I can send some information about the Langston Hughes Project, which is music, spoken word, and videography that I'm doing virtually. So uh, I would love to have a chance to speak with some of your students and some of your colleagues about this at some point. I'm going to be talking with, with Ernest when we get done. We'll see him some information about it. So but thank you guys for having me again. I really enjoyed this. So I'm turning it back over now to Brother Stackhouse. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's everyone give Dr. McGurdy a nice round of applause. If you unmute your microphones, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doc. This has been very, very educational. Thank everyone for participating and chiming in and giving us some uh, great questions and great comments in the session as well. Once again, this has been presented by Amia, the Advocates for Music and Music Education Association, where our purpose is to cultivate, support, and enhance music and music education in the state of South Carolina through fostering academic partnerships, professional learning opportunities, and resources for classrooms. And Doc, I just thank you for contributing to this in a great way today. And uh, before we go, if, if you could, uh, I guess, send me an email list of uh, selections that you recommend uh, educators and uh, students listening to um, or just getting started with, with, with getting in, into jazz. Give us a, a great standard list that we should be listening to of artists and then uh, I would really appreciate that. I can do that. Awesome. I can awesome. Ms. McLeod, do you have anything to add, sir? No, I just, uh, I, I talked to Ron, but Ron, you know, I'll be proud of you. And, uh, you know, you got your, got your, your second daddy right there. Oh, you know, that's my dog. Mr. <laughs> All right. You know, no, Ron, he was going to say something to if I didn't get him on the, on the, uh, on the zoom, you know, so, uh, uh, the meets. So he, so I'm safe now, you know, he won't do that Sunday school word. For me. I'm safe. <laughs> it's, always, it's always good to be a part of you guys. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Well, we gotta have you all on one day, Mr. <laughs> Again? Well, we gotta have you on one day, sir. Talk with us a little bit. <laughs> well, I will, I will. All right, we got you on tape. <laughs> <laughs> McLeod know how to get me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you all for joining us today. Doc, thank you, sir. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. Call me if you have any questions. Uh-huh. If, you think, if you think of anything else, I'm only a phone call away. Uh-huh.